became legal, the debate over abortion has not gone away. According to a new Wall Street Journal NBC News poll released today, 70% of Americans do not want to see Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court decision which legalized abortion. The biblical pattern for judgment is drought, famine, pestilence, war. God keeps saying to a nation, repent, don't go there. He keeps turning up the heat. The last seven speakers has news been a collapse every time. The last two has been on that exact date. We're at a tipping point, and I believe we're, I mean, we're past one of the tipping points, things that could foreshadow what could be the falling of America. And then you put this all together with what's happening in America right now. You put it together with what's happening morally, spiritually. You put it together with what's happening with Israel, with America, blessing Israel or not blessing Israel, and it, it becomes ominous. <laughs> prophets that are saying that 2016 is not going to be life as usual in America. Everything is going to be turned upside down. Everything is converging now. Well, you know what I told Jim? I said, Jim, this is the last time in over 400 years that we're going to have a tetrad, four blood moons on Jewish holy day. And the tragedy that I worry about is that the least prepared population of the planet Earth for what's coming, the one that least prepared is the American citizen. Yeah. If people have money sitting in a bank, they would be way better off to have it sitting in food. The stuff that you can buy right now, this long-term storage food kits, the dehydrated foods that you're selling, that stuff will be like gold. We would have never known anything about earthquakes being a sign of his coming had Jesus himself not told us that. Isaiah, it says there will be such an earthquake that the earth will reel to and fro like a drunkard. And it said that the islands of the sea will pass away and the cities of the nation will fall. So we've killed around 70 million of our babies. And you can't say we're good people. This is the time God enters the hiss of the heathen. The heathen have been mocking the church. The media and the heathen, they're going, ha, where is your God? Well, this is the year he answered. So we're living in a time when the dark is going to get darker, but the radical remnant is going to get brighter and brighter. We need repentance. America is not good anymore. And the Holy Spirit said to me, there is a consuming fire coming to America. I don't know how it's going. I don't know the form. I don't know if it's an asteroid. I don't know if it's an army. I don't know if it's riot. I don't know. The Lord is saying, tell the people a fire is coming. It will singe the sinners and purify the saints. The apostasy of America is, is, is the accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. And God is not mocked. So I believe all these things are cause that we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. We've got to get in the will of God. There's no safer place than the will of God. The, the most important preparation is to get right with God. Do you know where the safest place to be is? It's very clear. You want to be right in the center of God's will. Yeah, right. my spirit and what I'm seeing in the Word of God is telling me time is running out. We have banned God. We have mocked God. Judgment, I believe, is about to fall. Hello again, folks. This is Ronnie Turner with you from the Prophecy Freak YouTube channel. This week we're looking at uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn's interview on the Jim Baker Show. He's got some uh, really neat testimony from 9-11 uh, uh, as his church is actually in New Jersey. And uh, he actually, he and his wife witnessed uh, the 9-11 event. I thought that was uh, neat just to hear his point of view. But he's also given an update on the Harbingers, uh, the Tree of Hope, uh, the Sycamore, the uh, tower that has been built. Freedom Tower, as it's called, um, but it's also updating us on uh, America's apostasy. Um, we've had the uh, uh, Roe versus Wade, which uh, legalized abortion some time back, but now we have uh, the whole uh, homosexual agenda legalizing the marriage of uh, men with men. And uh, then he's also talking about the Shemitah and the Super Shemitah, which the Shemitah ends this coming week, as we uh, remember the 14 years since uh, the 9-11 tragedy, um, we're actually uh, entering into what he calls the Super Shemitah, which we've probably heard of the Jubilee. 
So it's the completion of the seventh Shemitah since the last Jubilee and goes through the restoration that uh, Israel has been through in the last two Jubilees. So all that I thought was really interesting and the fact that that's coinciding with the blood moons, he touches on that. And then just uh, America's continued fall uh, as an economy, as a military power, as a world leader. And uh, most of all, as a Christian nation, we have uh, turned our back on God. And um, there's uh, a big potential and opportunity for judgment as uh, the rabbi sees it. And he feels like we need to be prepared for that as it comes. And at the same time, it's going to be an opportunity to um, bring about the great awakening uh, for everybody to realize that God is real and we need to, to turn back to him. And as believers, we're going to have the opportunity to uh, witness to others and to be there to, to help them to understand what's going on. So uh, in that sense, I think it's something that should be exciting for us. It, you know, it could be a difficult time, but at the same time, it's the trials and tribulations which uh, bring people closer to God. So in that sense, it could be a blessing. So anyway, I thought you guys would want to see this. It's a pretty good uh, overall uh, update from the rabbi and uh, what he's been teaching us about the Shemitah and uh, what possibly could be ahead. So you guys check it out and see what you think. scheduled to be there at the building at 9 o'clock in the morning. And the last minute, her plans were changed. That happened to several people in our congregation. I had to go there and actually all the tolls were free because there was nothing happening. I mean, everything was shut down totally to get there. But we could see that, and that's when I first prayed, Lord. And that's when it first began to come, the, the harbinger. Really, the harbinger? Yeah. Well, the very first thing, the very first thing was the, that passage, that the chapter, the section, the Lord showed me then the section of Isaiah 9, 10, and 9 and 10, that whole first strike warning. That's what he, that was the first thing that happened that week when I prayed. But I didn't put it all together with that Isaiah 9, 10 scripture. But that's when it be, I knew, I knew the overall, I knew the overall setting. Later on, when I was standing in New York City at Ground Zero, and the Lord just, just said, see that tree there? And it was the remains of the tree, the sycamore, said, there is a mystery, and you have to seek this out. You have to find this. And that's when, I had no idea what I was going to find, but that's when the first puzzle piece, next one, it just kept coming and coming and coming. That's how I led me with the heart so, of the smoke. This was going on for that night, for the next thing. For the days. smoke going, yeah, for the, the day you could see it from oh, almost that wherever was, you went. They were the symbols of America's preeminence around the world of economy, economic, global, trade, all those things. All those things. When it came down, it struck the sycamore, which was the symbol of the beginning of America's rise financially. So this was a symbol, and then I believe a foreshadow, and this was the opulence of America. This was, the World Trade Center was actually conceived in 1945 when we were at the peak, you know, all that, and it was to be our, we are the new center of the world, mm -hmm. you know. And so this is very symbolic. I mean, and that this, these towers also went up in the year 1973, year of the Shemitah, where that was finished, which is also the year that America began killing its unborn children. Yeah. The towers stood as a symbol of our our glory, but it was also our shame. And they stood for the years that the, that this was happening, you know. And so I believe it's very symbolic of what that, that was, they, they, were, they were symbolic towers, you know. In the middle of the stock market. Yeah, the financial yeah. district, where also America began as a nation, where America was dedicated to George God. George Washington stood all that, that. All that. Where the right on that was, spot. I mean, right, right on that Right ground. where they, the, 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 the trees came down, actually, yeah. hit right there. Right, yes, yeah, <clears throat> where America was dedicated to God, and where also, on a, and also, that's the de marking the day when Washington gave the prophetic warning of what would happen if we ever turned away from God. Well, there's, there's a link between David Wilkerson and the Harbinger. First of all, first of all, he's the only one, the only other one, that after 9-11, he gave a word at Times Square Church, and his word was, he the word that he said God gave him was Isaiah 9 and then he said he said the bricks have fallen but we will rebuild the harbinger scripture he preached that you're kidding the, all, he said this is God's word for America without knowing the harbingers that most of them had not even been known or manifest but he said that exact thing he said we have responded to ancient Israel and this is where we're going without knowing that so he was the only other one who did that and so there's always been this link and we are kind of in the same neighborhood we met once you know actually long before the harbinger um, and actually when he you know, he, he went to be with the Lord, you know, um, and the next day, I got the news, the next day, I got the contract to sign 
a harbinger for it to go forth. It wow. was almost like he went to the Lord, and then this went, and I there's something about it. And you know, wow. he he had ideas about timing, which I I don't believe was the timing. But the interesting thing is, things that he said have all gone in that direction. And now, there are, I'll, before we finish, you know, before yes. I, before I leave, yes. um, I'll sh there's some very striking things that are that are matching up with what I we're not, right I now. have not seen all like it's almost like every factor, everything pointing to judgment, pointing to shaking, is happening now. From from America's gigantic accelerating apostasy right now to God crossing thresholds right now. We've touched upon the possible what as we are here now in light of the Supreme Court ruling. America and Israel has never been at its at its at, as horrible as it is right now. The relationship is at its worst point. The Bible says, if you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. If you curse Israel, you'll be cursed. And we are now on the verge of abandoning Israel. The administration has threatened to. Well, you abandon Israel, what happens to you? You know, you put Israel in danger, what happens to you? That's happening at the same time. These are two dangerous things at the same time. Third, it's the year of the Shemitah. This is the year that every time, the last seven times, every single one has been a crash, a collapse. And it can also mean the collapse of nations. And at the same time, we're watching even the Harbingers. The last Harbinger has just been being completed, that tower, that, that is the, the embodiment of defiance. You know, we've defied it, now we've done it. Right? Yeah, and this is exactly doing, it's almost like the embodiment of Isaiah 9:10. We will rebuild bigger, stronger, and when is it, when did it open up? It's, it's not, it hasn't been dedicated yet, but when did it open up? Two weeks into the Shemitah, it, only in the year of the Shemitah. It was birthed, it was conceived in the year of the Shemitah when when Tom Daschle said, we will rebuild from Capitol Hill. I know that there is only the smallest measure of inspiration that can be taken from this devastation. But there is a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. And now it's being complete, just like the World Trade Center was conceived in the Shemitah, was finished in the Shemitah, was destroyed in the Shemitah. And so now this tower is being completed in the Shemitah as well. All these things together, I mean, so much, the harvest, everything is converging right now. So I believe we now really need to be the ready. one world tower. One world tower, yeah. Oh God, that's even worse. <laughs> they they changed it when when China became the first client of the tower. And they changed it, and and the and so a whole bunch of floors of that tower is called the China Center. Well, what what it's happened? Scary to me. Well, what happened in this Shemitah is America was supplanted, dethroned as the strongest economic power by China after 140 years. But it was already in the tower. And that was the, that, that actually, we got unthrown the first day of the Shemitah. The first two weeks it, was, right? it came out, the, yes. Yeah, that, yeah. This is the year of the tower's finishing. And one of the things they, one of the things that happened with the tower is that one of the first stories, once they opened it up, is the stories came out that the tower has been overrun with rats. Oh. I mean, this is a tower representing America, just like that. Over uh -huh. that was their that was their first thing. It wasn't just people who moved in; rats moved in. I believe God always warns before He judges, and the point of this is that this was to get out before what is coming, before what is coming. God's people can prepare, and those who are not God's people can look afterwards and say, "God is calling us. We need to get back to God. We need mm -hmm. to get to God." Yes, That's it is the harvest time. Yes, yeah. I, God's heart is revival. You know, yeah. and sometimes people ask me, is it going to be judgment or revival? And I say, it can be both. God gave a grace period, a period of grace to come back or not. And then when that period was over, this is a pattern more than once in the Bible. Many times. Happened with Judah too. First, first came, first came this attack by Nebuchadnezzar. Then years later comes the full thing. Well, with, with this, what happened is a uh, number of years later, God then says, okay, now I am withdrawing my protection entirely. And then the same ones who brought the first shaking come back, but now it's not just a temporary wake-up call, now it's the full thing. And so they come back, the Assyrians come back, and now the, the kingdom of Israel, northern kingdom, is wiped off the face of the earth. God warned them, called to them, pleaded with them, shook them, did everything he could do. The Bible says it. 
and they turned from him. They rejected all of it. They rejected his Pictures. prophets. They rejected the warning. Yeah. We talked at certain times. I come back with a report that they have not stopped. They've continued. And I'll just touch on the last two, but there's right. something more on the, the last one that just happened before I, a little while before we came out here. And the first, just to bring it up to speed and link it even to other things. The one, the two are the tree of defiance, of hope, and the other is the tower. Yeah. The tree that was planted at ground zero, which was the tree of judgment, we will come back stronger, the Erez tree, planted on ground zero where the sycamore was struck down. What the, what the Jewish people, what the Israelites said, this is, our, this is a symbol of us coming back stronger. As we, I shared after, this is after the book, because when, when the book came out, it, had just, it was planted, everything was going well, but then according to the Bible, one of the signs of judgment is the tree shall wither away. The tree of hope, representing America, withered away, withered away, no matter what they tried. I found out they actually tried to put new soil, they replaced all the soil, and it still withered away. And so to one of the signs, in, you'll see in the prophets, I will break off the boughs, I will break off the branches, break off your glory. They broke, the tree of hope got its branches broken off because it was diseased, no matter what they did, broken all off. The president came down to ground zero, reads a, re, gives a speech with a psalm in it, a very strange thing to read because the psalm says, the one that they chose for him was, come and, he's in ground zero, and he's saying, come and see the desolate, the devastation God has done. He reads it. And oh. then, then, he, then down that same psalm, he's going to read a blessing, which is, he, and God breaks the bows and arrow, he breaks the bow, brings peace. He changes the word, and I believe it's just like the harbinger. Nobody's planning to do this. Nobody knows what they're doing. Changes it from bow, B-O-W, to B-O-U-G-H, bow. He breaks the bow, which is the judgment sign of the Bible. He will break the bow, the branches, which right across from him is the tree with its branches broken. He says that when the White House actually releases the text of the scripture, this is in print, from the White House, they change the word from, from bow, bow and arrow, to bow judgment. They actually change the scripture. It means something totally different in Hebrew. Judgment. So there's that tree. And then a year ago, one year ago, because when I first came here, it wasn't the case. A one year ago, the tree of hope, representing America, its glory is destroyed. It falls, is destroyed. Then the day it's destroyed is the Hebrew holy day. It's destroyed on Passover last year. And that the night of its destruction, the moon turns red. The night of its destruction of the harbinger comes the first blood moon. Oh. It ushers in, the harbinger's fall ushers in the blood moons, which begins well, then, that same night. And now we're coming to the end of that. So you got two yeah. harbingers, you have that linked to the, to the moon. Well, the other harbinger is, of course, the tower. That's the big one. That's what's the final one, the tower. I won't go into all of it except to say, for those, because those who know here, this is where they say, we will rebuild stronger. America vows to come back stronger, rebuild as ancient Israel did. The ancient Septuagint says, not just we will rebuild, it says we will build, come let us build a tower. The tower, they get it from Babel. They, the rabbis put Babel on Isaiah 9:10. That is this tower of defiance, which is exactly what, I mean, John Kerry, Secretary of State, he said when he was a senator, he said, we must build that tower stronger to show the world we are defiant. Defiant. So it goes up stronger been building, and then we, we mentioned the president comes down, he inscribes the vow basically up on the top of the Tower of Defiance, and then when he's being inaugurated the second time, which I was here when we, that election happened, that was a tipping point, and what he does is he, the president chooses a poet who then from, in the middle of the inauguration at Washington, not only does the president enlist the entire nation into ending the biblical definition of marriage in that speech, first time ever, but also the poet that he chooses says, gives a poem of praise, not to God, but praise to, of our, to our own hands. And he says, we pray, the works of our hands, he's praising, giving thanks. And the final thing he says, he speaks of the harbinger at the, at the inauguration, that the tower going up, that, that is jutting it to the heavens, he's saying that the heavens yield to our resilience. He speaks of the harbinger in terms of Isaiah 9 10. Then, after that, the progression, they tried to build, they put the spire up, they're going to put the spire up on the tower to complete it. The day they chose was April 29th, the same day that the cross went up on Cape Henry when America built its first, its first object on American soil. When they dedicated America to God, Cape Henry, April 29th, same day, they're going to build that, they're going to put the, the spire on the tower. But that day, the wind blows and will not, it, it will not 
they will, well, the wind will not let them do it. So they can't put up this fire on April 29th. They, they put it two weeks later, it goes up. As it goes up, two things happen. That hour, the scandal breaks across America about the IRS persecuting Christians and, and pro-Israel groups, breaks in the same hour. And that day, the sun is darkened over the tower. The sun is darkened, solar eclipse. You got the blood, you got the red moon on the oh. other harbinger. You got the sun being darkened on this harbinger. Um, this one kind of happens that way. They opened up the, the top floor. They opened up the top floor, finally, of the tower. On Friday, I believe, they opened up. Sunday comes the storm, and that top, the top of the tower that they just opened up to be completing is struck by lightning three times. Three times. In fact, we may have a picture. That was just, it was struck three times, right? Right after they opened it. Right after, just before we left. That tower is the completion, is the embodiment of all the harbingers, begun with that stone of judgment and, and, and coming to its head. So that's where we are right now. Now, um, one of the things I want to just, one of the things we're watching, and we're not only really watching this moral collapse in this year, but as we said, as they call evil good, they call good evil, persecution. Listen to this statement. This is recent. Listen to this statement. Or I'll just say, deep-seated religious beliefs have to be changed. Oh. Now, that would sound, who said that? Joseph Stalin? I mean, a communist, you know, deep-seated, meaning the Bible, religious beliefs have to be changed. Not Joseph Stalin. The one who said it was Hillary Clinton. Ah. Just recently, running for president, she oh. said, deep-seated religious beliefs have to be changed. Why did she say it has to be changed? talking about the Bible. I don't remember any American leader ever coming to this point to be able to say something like that. The, the religious beliefs of Americans have to be changed. Why, she said, so abortion can expand. Now, listen to this statement. This is, this is a different kind of statement. I believe marriage is not just a bond, but a sacred bond between a man and a woman. I have, in, my, my, in my life, I have defended marriage. It's the fundamental bedrock principle that exists between a man and a woman. It is for millennia, been ra for the raising, socializing of children, in which they're gonna, but who said that? Hillary Clinton. This is she said that 2004. 2004, she said, it's the sacred bond of marriage. And now it is, now she says it has to be, that has to all be, cha all be changed. And this is what she originally said. This is, but that shows you, this is how fast it's happening. Now, we are watching, I'm going to say, you know, very shortly, I've said it a few times, I told you that I was called to Washington. I actually stood on the steps when I saw these people in sackcloth and ashes on the day that the Supreme Court heard the case. If this goes the way, if marriage is struck down, this is gigantic. This is major gigantic, not just for, not just be concerning immorality, but also concerning persecution. Once this happens, if what is immoral becomes institutionalized, becomes legitimized, then what is moral would become delegitimized, will become persecuted. Now I mentioned something, now I'm gonna bring it to David Wilkinson, but I mentioned something a few times ago where uh, where the actual, this is ominous, but the actual White House lawyer said to the Supreme Court during that day, said that, yes, if this happens, basically, in effect, we will go after the religious or Christian schools. Tax exemption stripped, then it will go to the to ministries, tax exemption stripped, because you're haters, according to this, if you don't go along with this, and then churches. Now listen to what, now I was looking at the vision, listen to what David Wilkerson said. Now again, he thought the timing was going to be then, it wasn't. But listen to what he says. An antichrist spirit, this is in 1973, will enter the hearts of certain men in high places, in government and in the judicial system, causing these officials to harass independent churches, missionaries, and ministers. I see a time coming when nearly all evangelical and missionary projects, all religious radio and TV programming, all incorporated missionary societies will be so closely monitored questioned and badgered that he will be cautious of expanding in any area. There is coming an attempt to tax churches and church-related organizations. Atheist forces, with the help of the American Civil Liberties Union, will push the matter all the way to the Supreme Court. We will eventually have taxation of churches. It will begin as an in insignificant kind of nuisance tax, but will soon burgeon into a monster-sized tax that will push some independent churches and missionary societies near bankruptcy. Church-related businesses will be taxed first, that will soon be followed by taxation of all church-owned properties, including parsonages. Church buildings will be exempt. The IRS may one day become one of the most powerful weapons against the church. It would then be possible 
for government, government agencies to maintain a stranglehold on churches. Government agencies are soon going to become delving into the private books of almost every nonprofit religious organization. Those who do not comply with stringent guidelines will be forced to shut down. There will be no recourse. This is 1973. It's happening now. Yes. Happening now. Wow. Now, I'm going to get to something else that he said, but let's get to that. That's linked to collapse. I want to get, so I want to touch on the Shemitah yes. and what, where it is. <clears throat> The last two cycles of the Shemitah have been the most exactly, uncannily exact. And I believe, I believe they have a clip, of, which is a short clip of that. It's clip number three, I think, but it's of the last growing manifestations, if they have that. The collapse reaches its peak at the end of September 2008, with what becomes the greatest single-day crash in Wall Street history. That morning... In the New York Stock Exchange, the opening bell refuses to sound. Even Wall Street takes it as an omen. The stock market crashes over 700 points. On what date did the greatest crash in Wall Street history take place? It is September 29th, 2008. But the ancient biblical calendar holds a different name. The greatest stock market collapse in world history takes place on the 29th day of Elul, the exact day appointed from ancient times for the nullifying of the financial realm, the wiping out of financial accounts. Elul 29, the day of the Shemitah, the sign of judgment against a nation that has driven God out of its life. The judgment that specifically strikes the nation's economic and financial realm. The two greatest collapses in stock market history up to those dates each took place on the same exact day on the ancient biblical calendar and they just happened to each take place on the precise biblical day that specifically ordained to touch the nation's financial realm and to wipe clean its financial accounts from ancient times the day of financial nullifying and it's not only Elul 29 but it can only be one Elul 29 in seven years that can constitute the day of the Shemitah, the day of nullification. So on which Elul 29 did the greatest stock market collapse take place in the year 2008? It happened on the once in seven years Elul 29, the exact one that constitutes the day of the Shemitah and the greatest crash of 2001. When did it take place? It happened on the once in seven years of Rule 29 that also constituted the Bible's day of the Shemitah. So when all across the world, observant Jews are symbolically canceling out their debts to each other, the greatest wiping out of financial accounts in history is taking place on Wall Street and sweeping across the globe. According to the ancient mystery, the financial nullification has to take place seven years apart from the one before or after. So the two greatest financial nullifications in Wall Street history up to their dates take place seven years apart. Not only on Elul 29, but seven years apart. Seven exact biblical years apart. Down to the exact season, the exact month, the exact date, the exact hour, the exact minute, the exact second, the exact closing bell. No human hand in the world could have orchestrated such a thing. It required the working together of every financial transaction and interaction in the world. It even required that 9-11 had to have happened exactly when it did, as it was 9-11 that caused Wall Street to collapse in 2001 on the exact ancient appointed day coming up to the next one. Now, the next one's coming up. It's close. Now, I want to, Now I have to do my normal thing. Yeah. Just everybody no, we're not saying God has to do it on the date. God has, does not do anything. I can come back, and it was a very nice day, and everything was, was all that. But it could, and I believe we should be ready. But either way, if it happens then or later, I believe strongly a very great shaking is coming to this nation that will involve the financial realm, economic realm, and more than that, and more than that, even to changing courses of history. So it could begin here or what, but we need to be ready. So now when's it gonna happen? It's gonna happen, Elul 29 falls on September 13th. September 13th is Sunday, there's no market open. But the last day that the market is open, that will be frozen at this date, will be the date of 
will be the 14th anniversary, two Shemitahs from the day of 9-11. September 11th. That's Friday. Friday, just be coming up before you go into a Rule 29, will be frozen at 9-11's number, you know, which actually happened on 9-11. 9-11 happened, the market's stock was frozen at 9-11, the 9-11's number, that went right into the, the Alul 29 opening next week, and it crashed from 9-11. Actually, I'm throwing this in, this is just extra, but, but the, the, the number that was frozen for a week from 9-11 was the number, the stock market was at 9605. That's 9, and that 6 plus 5 is 11. It would, came out to 9-11. <laughs> that, was, that was the number, frozen. So it's going to be again 9-11. Now, what's going to happen on that day? Well, one thing we know is going to happen. On the day of wipeout of Luke 29, the sun will be darkened again. It will be the eclipse of the sun oh. happening on the day of wipeout, on the day of nullification, on that time. Now, I want to share something. This isn't that David Wilkerson now. Now, listen. This is okay. what he said. Okay. This was, this was. I mean, in the vision, he talks about an economic collapse. But this is something he, I think, came out in the 90s, though. But listen to this. So very, he said, soon a European or North African or Eastern nation is going to default in its international loan. Now, I'm not, now I, we don't know that's the case, but in the news, you've got Greece going on there. With this, I'm not saying it's a. And People then, are pulling their money out yeah, of the banks in Greece yeah. as yeah. we speak. Yes, that's right. I mean, they may even get a deal, but we don't know. And then, then what happens? With, he says, then what happens? Within two weeks, well, he, he said Mexico will default. About two weeks after the first country goes bankrupt, when which money is owed to European banks, German, which is part of this whole thing, yeah. Swiss and French banks, but a second country is going to go down, probably Argentina or Brazil. Two weeks after the first country goes down, Mexico will, will default. When the banks open the next day at 9 in the morning, $15 billion an hour is going to be withdrawn from our American banks. They're going to be running our banks. The Arabs, all the Latin American countries, they're going to be running our banks. Before the day is over, the USA is going to have to declare a bank holiday. From the time the first country goes down, you'll have two weeks to get your money out of the bank. Now I'm going to give you a word of advice. When the first country goes bankrupt, you get every dime you have. Church, get your money out of the bank because... There's going to be a bank holiday, and you won't be able to get a dime for six months. Now, of course, there's going, to be a res there's going to be a restoration, but the nation will never be as it was again. Now, I'm, this is, I'm not saying it has to be Next David, David Wilkerson, but it's just very interesting. Mm -hmm. They're talking about defaults and things like that. I want to just touch on two things, and one is the Super Shvita, or the Juba, prophetic jubilee. Now, I don't know if you have time to do yes, it. Yes, we Can have you time. You'll do it? Okay, it won't be Your time is my time. time. Okay. All right, we have, I believe, clip number two, which is the mystery of the seventh Shemitah. Let's just talk because this is also, this cycle is starting shortly. It's the first time in 2,000 years that the land is being restored to the Jewish people. The year following the Shemitah was September 1917 to September 1918. The Balfour Declaration takes place in November 1917. Thus, the land is restored to the Jewish people in the year following the Shemitah corresponding to the Jubilee. It's a prophetic Jubilee, and according to the mystery, the Jewish people now would return home to the land they had lost, to their father's possession, to their ancestral homeland. Everyone shall return to their possession. The mystery of the Jubilee concerns the seventh Shemitah. So what happens if we move forward in time from the Shemitah of 1917, 49 years to come to the seventh Shemitah? What is the seventh Shemitah? It brings us to the Shemitah of September 1965 to September 1966. The year following the Shemitah, would begin September 1966 and end September 1967. Did anything significant take place within that year and within those dates? Any event of restoration? The answer is yes. According to Bible prophecy, the Jewish people have to be restored not only to their homeland but also to their ancient holy city of Jerusalem. In the midst of the Six-Day War, Israeli soldiers enter the Lion's Gate of the biblical city of Jerusalem. Through gunfire, they make their way to the holiest site in Judaism, the Western Wall. There they weep. And after 2,000 years, the Jewish people 
are restored to their ancient capital, Jerusalem. It happens on June 7th, 1967, within the parameters of the year ending in September 1967, the year following the seventh Shemitah, the Jubilee. The seventh Shemitah had ushered in the second restoration of the land. According to the mystery of the seventh Shemitah, the Jewish people had returned to what they lost 2,000 years before, Jerusalem. They had regained their long lost possession and returned to their ancestral home. The two great restorations of the land each happened according to the mystery. The Bible ordains that in the year of the Jubilee, the Shofar, the ram's horn, is to be sounded. The first thing that happens after the soldiers reached the Temple Mount in 1967 is that the ram's horn is sounded from the Temple Mount. The sound of the Jubilee. The man who sounds it is Rabbi Shlomo Goren. Rabbi Goren was born in the year 1917, the time of the other restoration. When he sounds the shofar, he is 50 years old, the number of the Jubilee. The mystery of the Shemitah lies behind the two great end-time restorations of Israel's lands. Now the pattern and cycle does not have to continue, but if it did, what would be the seventh Shemitah from the last restoration? The seventh Shemitah begins September 2014, goes to September 2015. The year following the seventh Shemitah is that of September 2015 to September 2016. While the cycle doesn't have to continue and nothing significant has to take place, in the last two occurrences, it has meant war in the Middle East, war in the land of Israel, and a war resulting in a prophetic restoration. Wow. I show this for this reason, that it's not only the climax of the Shemitah, it's also the beginning of what you would call the Super Shemitah, or the Prophetic Jubilee. Now, again, we don't put God in a box, it doesn't have to do anything, but what it has meant is war, what it has meant is a change in Israel. This is massive. When you take these two things, 1917 was the land, 1967 was Jerusalem. Now what's next? So if this, we have to be ready in either way. So we got all, talk about convergences, We've got all, everything we just said, everything, change, and we have a potential change in world history, even prophecy. It doesn't have to, but I would be ready. Wow. So that, that is from the, the mystery of the Shemitah unlocked. Let me just share one more quick point, and that is that, and this is from, on the, in the teachings, it's the days of the watchmen. We are called in this day to be watchmen. Yes. We must be the watchmen, and just some keys to be, I give the keys about how to be a watchman, but the key is this, no matter who you are, man, woman, child, doesn't matter. We are called to be watching, we must stay on the walls. In other words, we must stay on the rampart. In other words, we cannot get so wrapped up in the world, we cannot get wrapped up in all the details if we're gonna hear from God. The watchmen have to look, they have to stay above the city. We have to stay above what's happening. We have to be in God's presence in order to, to be the watchman we're supposed to be. We have to be on the watchtower. We have to stay in the presence of God or we cannot be watchmen. And we have to be looking, the watchmen look into the distance. They don't, they don't look at everything around, they look into the distance. They look to what's coming. They are ready to what they are looking that way. The watchmen, they are acting at night. Things get dark, that's their hour. That's their hour. We can't fear the, the darkness because God called us for the darkness. God called us to be strong. We, the watchmen, once they see something, they have to sound that shofar. We have to not be silent. We must sound the alarm. The first, one of the first times I came here, I went to Branson Airport, and I'm leaving, I'm thinking, Lord, you know, this is a heavy message. You know, why do you have me doing this? And I open the Bible, it's, he bombards me, son of man, when, I, when danger is coming, if the watchman does not sound the alarm, I will hold him accountable. I've, I've called you to do this, you must, we are all watchmen, we must sound the alarm. God has called us to be faithful on the walls. And faithful, and that means we have to be in the presence of God. He will not only keep us, but we will be strong for this hour. God has called us for this hour that is coming.